The first reading for daily Mass this week and next is taken from the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis. The section as a whole pushes back the biblical story beyond its account of Israel's forebears into the dawn of history and to the very moment of creation. It paints in broad strokes the cosmic and human context for God's call of and covenant with Israel. Genesis, as its title suggests, is about beginnings. Its opening chapters contain two differing but complementary accounts of the process by which the world and humanity have come to be. The first account emphasizes divine transcendence and power. God speaks and things are created. The climax of the presentation comes on the sixth day with the appearance of human beings. Their unique dignity is rooted in the fact that they are made in God's image and likeness. To them, God entrusts creation. They are to increase and multiply and to exercise stewardship over the earth. The second account, which we began with yesterday's reading, focuses almost entirely on human beings. The author is drawn to the kind of questions which continue to haunt and fascinate people today. When we're young, we tend to raise them in a personal way. Who and what am I? With time and experience, our questions become more general. What does it mean to be human? What is this strange mixture in us of the material and the spiritual, of the body with all its beauty and vulnerability, and our capacity to know and love in ways that transcend the body? How is it that we are capable of such extraordinary good and of such utter self-destructiveness? What balance should we seek between our individual goals and desires and our social responsibilities? Why is the relationship between men and women so powerful and promising and yet so often unsatisfying? How are we to understand our longings for the infinite and for all that is good and at the same time our inability to foster and respond to such longings. The contrast in the language of the two accounts of creation is striking. The first is in the form of a solemn and majestic poem and emphasizes God's total otherness. The language of the second is more concrete and imaginative. Presented almost like a human being, God uses the earth to create man and a rib from man's side to create woman. He plants a garden and walks in it and converses with his creatures. The emphasis in today's reading is on our social nature. It is not good, God says, that the man should be alone. We are made to be in relationships, in families first of all, but in other ways as well. The focus of our reading is on the most essential and fundamental of all relationships, that of man and woman, the basis of the family. Before creating woman, God forms out of the earth every animal of the field and every bird of the air and, every, and brings them to the man who gives them their names. The incident underlines both the connection of humanity with the rest of the animal world and its distinctiveness from it. Like them, we are made from the earth. But unlike them, we have a gift that enables us to know them and to name them, and in doing so to accept a certain responsibility for them, their naming points forward to the development of science and to all our efforts to understand and care for the world. In spite of the positive connection that exists between man and the animals, none of them is found to be a fit 
partner and helper for him. None can speak to his heart or offer him the relationship for which he longs. The imaginative and poetic way in which the creation of woman is described underlines her equality and dignity and value to her partner. She comes from him, from one of his ribs. When presented by God with the woman, the man's response is spontaneous and from the heart. It reflects an experience that will be repeated across the centuries whenever a man falls in love with the woman with whom he hopes to share his life. This at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Commenting on the man's reaction, the text explains that it is for this reason that a man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife, and they become one flesh. They are no longer two, but one. From now on, their lives, their happiness, their destinies are inextricably intertwined. The last verse of the reading contains a rather enigmatic statement suggesting primal innocence. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. The image of humanity offered up to this point by Genesis could not be more positive. Men and women are made in God's image and likeness and have easy access to him. Endowed with equal dignity and value, they are to live in harmony with and support of one another. Their tilling of the garden underlines that work is part of their lives. They are to develop their abilities and talents and to put them at the service of transforming God's creation. All this is to be carried out in an atmosphere of peace, peace with oneself and others, peace with the world, and with God. Tomorrow's reading will disturb this idyllic vision with his introduction of sin. Bringing self-destruction and conflict in its wake, it will make life more onerous and difficult and relationships more ambivalent. Hardship and toil, jealousy and violence, greed and domination, these and similar things will become part of our experience. Salvation in Christ is meant to help us to the degree possible in this world to become the kind of people that God intended us to be from the beginning. The wonderfully positive and uplifting view of human life found in the first pages of Genesis suggests something of what that involves. It encourages us to do what we can to make it a reality in the midst of the inevitable limitations of our lives and of our world. Although we will never succeed fully, we can make a difference. Let us now in faith and trust present before God our needs. For all of us that are sharing in this Eucharist will deepen our sense of the beauty and dignity of human life. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord. For the working poor and for the unemployed, let us pray to the Lord. Lord. For all those who participate in the televised Mass and who have phoned or written in asking for our prayers, let us pray to the Lord. Lord. For the safety and well-being of Canadian soldiers serving in Afghanistan and for peace and justice in that war-torn country, let us pray to the Lord. Lord. For those who have died recently and for all our dead, that they will be brought to eternal life in God, let us pray to the Lord. Gracious God, we ask you to hear and grant these prayers as well as the more personal ones that each one of us has in his or her own heart. All this we pray through Christ our Lord. Amen.